you so much. And um, before I start, I just want to thank everybody who's here. Um, the psychiatric medicine, um, your field, I wouldn't, there, the, I wouldn't be here without your field. And I was certainly born um, into some privilege. Um, the, the US is a fantastic place to get healthcare. Um, and I came from a very caring, loving, wonderful family. Um, and I had many advantages um, that helped me to get through depression. But without psychiatric medicine, I wouldn't have. And um, what and what I want to say to you is that by you being here, it's clear that you're interested and you're very involved in continuing education. And um, the first psychiatrist I saw when I was diagnosed was um, he was in his 60s and he was very current and I think even ahead of his time in some of his thinking. Um, and so I just, I just want to thank you for, uh, for what you do, for your passion, and for your commitment, and uh, for continuing throughout your career to, to advance, um, advance psychiatry and to look at the research and um, to continue to make yourself a um, better practitioner. So, so thank you very much for that. And um, he already said my only disclosure, I promise I will not try to sell you shoes. <laughs> uh, so just a little overview of what I'm going to be talking about. It's basically uh, my talk's going to be in about in, in two parts. Uh, first off, I just want to give you um, a bit of my history and you know, sort of how I grew up, maybe a couple clues um, that I missed um, that depression might be in my future, um, and, and how depression sort of shaped my life. Um, I, I am who I am. Um, because of all the experiences I've had, but depression was a was a big factor and a big uh, my 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 first severe bout um, really did uh, change my life and, um, and and so I think it's important to talk about that and um, with that I'll be um, telling the story of my first year um, dealing with depression and and part of it is a story I've been working on telling uh, for about six months now, and, I, and this is the first time I'll be telling it publicly. Um, so so the, I'll be going through that. And then, um, and, and that history sort of continues through my ultra career, um, to sort of explain that a little bit, and, um, and, and about sort of future thoughts I have with combining um, physical therapy, um, advocacy, um, and, and running. And, and so um, I'll get into that. And then the second part is just about how I use um, running and exercise to help me with depression. I, I just give you a little bit of a, a patient perspective. We'll get into the more mechanical stuff when I talk to, with um, John later um, when, and talk about sort of how you use PT, physical therapy, how you use um, exercise, you know, the, just the, the, how to prescribe exercise. Um, if you want to do that with your with your patients. So my um, I was born in Vermont and um, had some challenges as a kid that didn't really um, affect me, but they sort of affected my my family. Um, I was um, born with uh, introverted um, femoral antiversion, um, so that my I was pigeon toed. And back in those days, they serial casted children, and luckily we were too young to you know, have any memory of that. Um, but interestingly, um, a physical therapist early in my life um, told my parents after I was done with the serial casting, get her cross-country skiing. You guys cross your family skis anyway. If she crosses the tips of her skis, she's gonna fall on her face, and that's gonna teach her pretty quickly that um, she needs to keep her mechanics straight. And, um, and the literature now doesn't really support the serial casting that I went through. But whatever happened, my mechanics, I am so very lucky, um, are made, um, are very straight, very, um, very healthy running mechanics. And, and that certainly is prerequisite to the sport I do. Um, so, so that's 
so, so that's how I got into skiing. I mean, I, I skied, I, I learned to ski about the time that I was learning to walk. And with a brother who was four years older than me, my parents needed to do something with me um, when they brought him to ski races. And so, so what happens in these little ski races for kids is that for the little, little kids, we race maybe the length of this room. And you know, your parents might be holding your hand or something. So, so, so I was literally racing at three years old. Um, and, and so I, I think that, um, that started my thinking about exercise and my, my thinking about competition as well. And I don't remember a time of my life when I didn't dream of being on a United States ski team. And that was the big thing. That's what I wanted from as long as I can remember. Um, I also wanted to, be, um, uh, wanted to be in medicine. I wanted to be a surgeon uh, or a veterinarian because little girls want to be what veterinarians, I think. But um, it, it, so, so those were my dreams. And I was just laser-focused kid on goals. And um, so sort of went through um, junior high school. I was racing seriously, high school racing seriously. Um, went to school, uh, went to college and, um, and raced Division I uh, ski racing. All of that stuff was, um, you know, was, was just as planned. I mean, it was just the, the whole plan I devised when I must have been just a little child um, seemed to be going very well. And, um, and, and one of the other little pieces that came to me when I was a kid, I was probably 12 or 13 years old, and I was in the, the youth ski league starts to get a little bit serious. Um, with 12 and 13 year olds. And so we'd have meetings um, with the famous cross country skiers of the US and they're only locally famous because at the time we were, our country was not very good at the sport. Um, but uh, we had um, the advantage, I had the advantage growing up with the US, the head coach of the US ski team living in my town. So he would come to our, um, you know, the first meeting of the year, and he would come out once in a while, and and um, and that added a lot of excitement to the sport. It made it very real. Like, he, like here's the U.S. ski team coach. He's talking to us, and he told us a story once, and and I don't know if it was really true or if it was rumor, but we lived in Vermont, and. Um, the long trail is this 273 mile trail, and it's not like trails here. You know, if you, if you go up to the Bay Area and, and do the Miwok trails, and they're fire roads and they're smooth, the long trail is, um, and you will see this later, um, is rocky, it's rooty, it's muddy, it has ladders. Um, and that's what I thought was a trail, because what do you do to train for skiing? You run. And, um, and so we just, as kids, just ran up and down these crazy trails, and we thought that was what every kid did. And so anyway, um, Mike Gallagher, the, the U.S. team coach, tells us that um, the U.S. men's team, ski team, has just run the long trail faster than it's ever been run before. And I don't remember what time that was. I can't find any sources that, that confirm or deny this. Um, but I was 12 or 13 years old, and there was a little seed planted. Um, but I was still very much a skier, quite a mediocre runner. Um, you know, uh, Williams College is a Division III school in, um, in running, and we're Division I in skiing. And I couldn't make the JV team my freshman year at Williams um, in running, and, um, and yet I was on the, the ski team. So um, it's sort of different body type for both sports. Um, I did well in college, but never as well as I really wanted. Um, you know, I, I would place in the top 20 at uh, NCAA Nationals each of my four years. Um, and, and, and that's good, but it's a world away from making an Olympic team. And so I switched to biathlon because I grew up a Vermont redneck, so I was comfortable with rifles. And, um, and I thought I was a good shot. And, um, and 
the biathlon it was at the time slightly less competitive uh, to make the Olympic team than um, straight cross country skiing. And, um, and I did well. My first uh, full year of biathlon, I was in Olympic trials. This is Olympic trials for the 94 Olympics. And, um, and my shooting was really not that good. Um, here I thought I'd do really well at it. And it turns out that shooting with a you know, heart rate around 160 is, is difficult. And, uh, <laughs> and I just don't have that kind of coordination, but it was really fun. And, um, but, but still, that Olympic trials, my best uh, placing there was 13th, and we were having five women who were probably going to the Olympics or just missed the Olympic team who were planning to retire that year. And so that put me just off the U.S. development team, which was exactly where I planned to be, because 98 Olympics were in Nagano, Japan, and that was the goal. I was to go to Nagano, represent my country, um, fully knowing that we'd place in the back of the pack, but it was the point was to make the Olympic team. And then I'd go to med school and continue my life. And I was living in Sun Valley, Idaho, which is just stunningly beautiful. Gorgeous, gorgeous place. I had a job uh, where my boss would let me um, take time off for skiing. Um, I had a wonderful relationship with uh, my boyfriend. It was sort of first love thing, and, um, and, and that was going well. And, um, and we had, na and that's, this is December. In March, we had national championships, raced really well. Um, still absolutely right in line for my goals. And April came around and I started sleeping more and training less and didn't think much of it. And um, by May, I'm starting to sleep in a way that is destructive to the flow of my life. I'm... Um, I'm sleeping enough that I'm not getting my training in. I am still able to work, but I'm not training. And I, I did have, of the, the, the fortunate things that I said I was very fortunate in, um, in my journey through depression, one of the things I had going for me is that my best friend in college had a, a, quite a severe bout of depression in 1991. And we're all old enough here to remember when Prozac jokes started showing up in late night television um, episodes, or, you know, whatever the versions of like the Letterman show were back then. And um, they were common. And I'm at a very liberal, liberal arts college. And yet I'm watching my best friend talk about her symptoms. And I, and, and she spoke about that within the ski team, and uh, the women's team was very, very close. And I, and I don't think she felt anything but sympathy and support from the ski team. But that wasn't the case with the school at large. And I remember once standing next to Kim um, right outside our suite in, in the dorm, and she's bawling inconsolably. I mean, here's the president of Phi Beta Kappa at Williams College, always in the top 20 at NCAAs in, in skiing. Um, she has her graduate school already sorted out, and she can't even get through the day without sleeping, without crying. And she's crying, and we're standing there, and I'm trying to console her. And one of my classmates walks by, and he just flippantly says, buck up, little camper, and walks by. And, um, and both of us wanted to, to hurt him, but we didn't. Um, but anyway, I had this. So I had this before I knew I had depression. And the other fortunate thing I had going for me was that my boyfriend had had, I wa he was my first love. I was his second love. And his first love had depression. And he noticed my changes. And he talked to me about them. And he suggested I call Kim. And I did. 
and um, Kim helped talk me through some of this. And um, by May, I'm sleeping 18 hours a day. Mm. By the end of May, I've lost my job as a cook. I can't read a newspaper article and tell you what it said. I cannot figure out the recipes for the scones I have to make at the cafe. And I'm just in this fog. And, um, and I'm, Kim calls me one night, and we're talking about this, and she says, you have to get to a doctor. In, in, and, and war was going on in Bosnia at the time. And she said, if you were in Bosnia, you would have to suffer. But you're here, and you're still on your parents' health insurance, and you don't have to suffer. And so by July, I had finally worked up the courage to go see um, this wonderful psychiatrist. And, and I was lucky in that the first person I went to see was the right person for me. And I, um, I walk in. I'm quite nervous. I mean, even though I, I, I love my friend Kim and I know she's strong and I know I, I have deep, deep respect for her, I'm still affected by the stigma around me mental illness. My parents are telling me that the problem is my boyfriend doesn't have a high enough education level and I'm not challenged and that's why I'm sad. And, and they're in Vermont and I'm in Idaho and there's no FaceTime. There's no Skyping. They can't see what I look like. And, um, and so I walk in, give him a bit of my history, and um, appropriately he asks if I'm suicidal. And I answer yes. And he asks if I have a plan. And I say yes, I'm, and I'm very comfortable with firearms, but I've seen my best friend go through this, and I've seen her very, very low, and I've seen her get better. And I will give you till October 1st of this year. And he said, we can work with that. That's OK. And um, that one sentence, we can work with that, was everything to me. Because it meant that what I had was something everybody else had, you know, other people had. It was something expected. It was something seen in regular illnesses. He was, he was calm. And, he uh, prescribed Prozac, and I was one of those very lucky people who my first drug really worked. Um, within a couple weeks, three weeks maybe, the suicidal thoughts were gone. Within another couple weeks, I was working again. And October 1st came and went. And I was, by this point, um, 20 to 25 pounds lighter than I am in that picture. So there was no way I was ski racing that year. And, um, but, I, I, but I had great people around me. And um, m one of my coaches suggested there was a master's national race in Sun Valley. And he suggested that I um, be the guide for the week for a blind woman who decided to race able-bodied um, nationals. And, and so I guided her. You know, my coaches just gave me things to do that I was capable of. And, um, and that was very helpful, and, and I gained strength, and I gained weight, and, um, and I was in control of my depression. I had this horrible, horrible thing happen to me, but I was completely in control. I had it, I had it nailed. I knew about depression. I understood it. And in February of that year, after having a condom break with my boyfriend, I went on oral contraceptives. And um, he, he joked with me once, well, these work because I can't get anywhere near you. You're miserable all the time. But he was still supportive. I mean, I, we kind of joked about that. And, um, and we were both cooks. At this point, uh, we were both um, cooking under chefs at separate fine dining restaurants. And so to have, um, to have really good time together, what we would, what our, one of our favorite things to do was host dinner parties 
or have dinner together. We were both cooks. We loved cooking. We loved food. And so we hadn't really seen each other in about a week. We hadn't had that time, despite we were living together, but, but we just, our, our schedules weren't meshing. And so this one particular Sunday, he had the day off, and all I had to do was prep for my chef, and I'd be home by 7. And so, um, so we decided that we would have date night that night. And I'm at work now. It's a Sunday. Um, things are going very smoothly in the, in the kitchen, and, and, and I really love the look of food. And so I'm prepping one of my favorite dishes because it just plates so beautifully, and it's, and it's duck breast. And if you picture duck breast, it's about um, two, two and a half centimeters of this beautiful purple red meat with about two or three millimeters of this creamy white fat on top. And I'm prepping, uh, I'm prepping for Felix. And to do this, we, we, we cut diagonally along the duck breast through the fat. And, and when you do that, the fat just separates. And you look through this white, kind of off-white color, and you see this deep purple underneath. And, and, and so I do that, and I, I get all of the duck breast prepped for that night. It's the last thing I have to do, and I, and I get it done, and I put some cellophane in it. I put it in the walk-in for Felix to use later. And I'm walking home, and I'm just in this great mood. I'm about to have dinner with my boyfriend, with my love, and I'm, and, and I'm finally feeling a little bit better. I, I knew I'd been off all week for about two weeks since starting um, oral contraceptives. And I'm feeling OK, and I'm, I'm looking forward to this. And I, I walk up the stairs to our apartment, and I see in the window that it's dark. And it's a little concerning because, you know, well, maybe PJ's out. And I open the door, and I'm just assaulted with the smell of beer. And at this point in my life, I wasn't drinking at all. I hated alcohol because I saw it as a depressant. And putting a depressant into a depressed brain didn't make sense to me. And in deference to me, PJ, who did like to party, didn't drink. And he hadn't had anything to drink in a few months. And I turned the light on, and there are beer bottles just strewn about this, this you know, dirtbag skier apartment. And, um, and I call a friend of mine, a mutual friend of ours, and I'm like, have you seen PJ? And, yeah, I think he's, you know, I saw him out drinking, and then he was going to go to Jen's house. Um, a bunch of people are going back there. And I'm just crushed. And I've just ha been stabbed in the heart with a knife. And I drive over, it's about two miles, drive over to Jen's house, and it's pouring rain. The rain is just bouncing off this black, black pavement where the snow is gone, and I'm... I'm on this crumbling slab of concrete that is the front of, of um, Jen's apartment. And I, I pound on the door, and nobody answers. And I pound again, and I'm, PJ, I know you're in there. You have to come out. And, and, I, and this goes on for a bit. And PJ opens the door eventually. And he opens his mouth to be like, well, you know, what's up? And, and all I smell is alcohol. And I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm devastated with this situation, and, and he agrees to go with me to go back home. He knows I'm just distraught, and I'm driving home, and I'm, and I'm trying to get him to react, and he just won't talk. I'm trying to figure out, why did you do this to me? This doesn't make sense. And I'm driving home, and the, the, the rain's getting harder, and, and my tears are coming more more quickly, and my eyes are filled with tears, and it's as wet as it is outside, and I'm barely seeing the road. The light's refracting off the, off the raindrops, and 
and the tears that are in my eyes aren't helping. And I get us home safely somehow. And PJ, kind of like a whipped puppy dog, follows me up the stairs. And he just sits on the couch in front of our ugly coffee table with these beer bottles around. And I, I'm still begging him to talk to me. I don't understand. Why aren't you talking to me? And I grab the beer bottle, and I smash it down on the table. And I look at it, and I'm fascinated with the shards that are left of the beer bottle. I, they're, they're mountain peaks, very, very sharp mountain peaks, like the peaks we run in Idaho, what we do all summer. And, um, and he's still not talking to me. And I have so much pain in my head right now that I cut myself. It's a little testing cut. I don't want to die. I just want to feel something that's not the pain in my head. And he doesn't react. And I don't feel anything. And I cut again. And then again. And this time I cut deep enough. And I see the white flesh separate to this purple meat, this beautiful color underneath. And I realize I've just fucked up. And I grab my arm, and it won't stop bleeding. And PJ picks up this dirty towel that he used to clean up beer earlier, and he wraps it around me. And I call my friend, and um, because I realize I can't get the blood to stop. And she takes me to the ER. It's the middle of the night by now. And I was feeling better by this point. And we were in the situation where you don't get health insurance if you have self-inflicted wounds. And I know this. And, I'm, and I've come back to myself enough to know this. And I'm, I'm smart enough to lie to the doctor. He clearly knows I'm lying. But I stay with the same lie. No, I put my hand in the wastebasket to pick something up, and the beer bottle just, just cut me. And, and he lets me go. And, um, and the next morning, I call my psychiatrist. I tell him what happened. I go in to see him. And then things calm down a bit. I call my parents. And I go home to heal. My confidence at this point is shot. I'm back in Vermont, and I'm old enough that I'm about to lose health insurance. I can't stay on my parents' health insurance anymore. And I'm not recovered, and I'm not seeing a psychiatrist now. I mean, my parents had, had come to realize that I really was sick, I think, but there was no talk of me going to a psychiatrist. I was functioning. I was OK. And, um, and my confidence was quite low. And um, so I'm trying to figure out, what do I do now? I, I, I need health insurance. I, I'm terrified of med school, because if this happens again, and I'm $200,000 in debt, I, like, I, I, can't, I can't live with that. And, for some reason in my brain, I thought PT school would be super easy, and you know, it's just three years of graduate school, and there's no residency, and um, you know, it's not this four-year thing. And so, so in my warped brain, I, I decided to go to physical therapy school, uh, which turns out to be a very good thing since my future is in running, but I don't know this at this time. And, um, and I take the prerequisites, and I, I heal. I'm doing quite well. And, um, and, and, and so I, I end up going to Philadelphia for, um, for physical therapy school. And I just love growth anatomy. I mean, it was, it's the first class we take. And it's two months, and it's super intense, and, um, and, and, but it's fun. I mean, it's just it's all your time, and it's, it's, it's just this great, great course. And I'm, I'm just in love with the physics of how the body moves. And, um, and so everything's going really well. And, um, and I need a doctor here, because I'm still on meds. Um, I don't know how I got the meds for this long a period of time, but I did. And, and, but I couldn't get any more. 
And I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, I'm doing pretty well. I don't think I need these drugs. I'm just going to go without. And within about a month, symptoms come back. My grades are slipping. Um, this is well after gross anatomy, fortunately. And uh, one of the professors at our school has had a lifetime battle with bipolar. And he takes me aside. There's something going on with you. And, um, and so I go, you know, I tell him what's happening. And, and he says, you know, you need to go see somebody. And I, and I make an appointment. Um, and I go into the doctor's office. And this guy looks like Sigmund Freud. And he asks, you know, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do when you're not in school? Well, well I run a lot. And uh, what are you running from? <laughs> <laughs> and um, he, you know, there wasn't the literature then talking about, um, about exercise helping with depression. But I think we were a little farther than what are you running from. And, and so, so I tell that story because because I appreciate people who really stay current and who really, um, you know, and, and the doctors who, who can help me and, and, and whatever person. I mean, maybe, in, and that physician might have been fantastic for some people. He wasn't fantastic for me. And so I'm in graduate school. And um, the thing about Philadelphia is there's no snow. And, um, and so this is where my running starts. I mean, I was a mediocre runner, obviously, in college and high school. Um, you know, not even be able to make a D3 uh, JV team. Um, so, I, so I start running. And, um, and, and it's super technical, because Philly's, Philly's technical, so that's what I'm good at. And, and I start running uh, decently enough that a local store shows some interest in me. And they sponsor me. And, um, and they take me to races. They pay my entry fees, give me a little singlet. And um, you know, I'm doing well enough that I can you know, make beer money for the house or whatever. So, you know, I'm not, not making a lot of money, out of it, but, I'm, but I'm having fun. And I have my fellow students saying to me, you know, we spend the entire weekend in the lab, and you're out racing. Like, how the hell are you getting good grades when you're out there just running? And, and um, saying to them, well, yeah, I'm out there running, but then when I come back to the lab, I'm doing my work. I'm not just complaining about how much work I have to do. I'm actually just, you know, because I, I saw what they were doing in the lab. And, um, and, and, and so running in graduate school, it doesn't take that much time. I mean, running is the, sort of the quickest fitness you can get in many ways. And, and, and it helped me, it really helped bring that clarity of focus back. And, um, and, and so that was super helpful. And I graduated um, eventually and, and, um, and moved to upstate New York, worked as a physical therapist. And during that time, I just took my trail running a little further. And so here's my career as a professional athlete. It's in, this, is, this is my sport. This is the sport that, that gives me that, um, that feeling of success, that feeling of getting my goal, of achieving my goals that I was seeking when I was that little three-year-old, and or four or five, whenever I figured that out. Um, and and so um, ultra marathon, it's getting to be more of a known sport, um, but I, but I'll just give you the definition anyway. An ultra marathon is anything longer than a marathon. So anything longer than um, twenty-six point two um, is, is just generically an ultra marathon. And so my ultra mar my ultra marathon um, running has evolved, and um, there's sort of some off um, offshoots of, of running of ultra marathon. And one of them, my favorite one of them, is fastest known time or expedition running, where you find um, the fastest known time. You find a, a, a defined trail, and you try to be the fastest person ever on it. And and that way, I can go anywhere from you know I can do a fastest known time on a 12 mile trail, or a 200 mile trail or wh whatever I wanted to do. Um, expedition running, um, another thing I really like, uh, one of my teammates back when I was with the North Face um, was a, a woman named Cami Semek, and fantastic runner and very, very intellectual. And she was living in Hong Kong at the time and um, 
she wanted to, um, to document this trade route in China um, that began in the year 600 and was being used until um, 1950. And, and so she wanted to document this um, be, be, before it was destroyed and lost forever. And, and it was, it's called the Horse Tea Trail. And um, the Chinese would trade tea with the Tibetans for Tibetan war horses um, to use in many of their, their, their fronts. And, and so, you know, you can take this sport in any direction you want to. And, and that's one of the reasons I fell in love with it. Um, and the ultramarathon culture is another reason I'm, I'm in love with the sport. Um, the culture encourages volunteerism, um, and, and sometimes it's forced volunteerism. Um, <laughs> but uh, so the Western States 100, like many 100-mile races, requires people to uh, put in at least eight hours of service to the ultra-running community, um, whether that's heading in the aid station or directing a race or doing trail work, trail maintenance work. I and mean, we want to be good stewards um, of the trails we use. And um, philanthropy. Um, there are lots of runners out there, lots of ultra runners, um, and, and very good ultra runners who frequently pair their ultra running exploits with um, with making money for charity. Um, you know, in, in my tenure in the sport, um, particularly when I was at my peak, there really wasn't much money to be made as an athlete. But what we could do was make a difference, and um, and people have done, um, um, you know, tried to raise money for, um, for environmental causes or social causes. Um, I, I once went to South Africa with, again, with Cami, and um, because we were in South Africa, we wanted to do something for that piece of South Africa, and we found um, an AIDS orphan charity that it was um, a, a little village. Um, this branch of it was, was a little village sitting on the course, like right on the course. And um, these were, th th this charity kept children who had lost both parents to HIV AIDS in their homes and it kept them in their schools and it provided them after school sports programs so that they weren't victims of crime on their way home. Um, fantastic thing. and, and um, and, and that kind of stuff, it's not just us. I mean, many of the top ultra runners of my generation do this kind of thing. And then there's um, this sort of spontane spontaneity of teamwork. Um, um, at Western this past year, um, I, I, I sort of started to bonk. I was losing my, um, I, I was losing my ability to, to keep going well, and all my muscles were, they were cramping up so badly that I was kind of walking like I was on stilts. And, and, and I was just a disaster. And I sat down on the edge of the trail. And um, one of my competitors, and, get, and, and note that we're in the top 10 of one of the most important races in the world. And Denise comes up to me, and she's like, what are you doing? And she picks me up. And she's like, come on, you're going to walk with me. And and you know, I walk, my muscles loosen up, I eat some food, and, um, and I feel good again. And, and that happens all the time in the sport. Um, my ultra feats, I think John covered that. <laughs> um, so depression and ultra running, is there a connection? And we'll talk about this in the next talk. Um, um, there certainly is, and I think that we self-select. I think a lot of us um, who are drawn to these sports, we're drawn to them because we feel better. And maybe somebody who has mild to moderate depression sort of organically um, runs because that makes them feel better. And they're never diagnosed with depression because they never have the symptoms because they're active. I mean, that, 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 that certainly can happen. And I, and I, I feel that um, a lot of people in the sport are, are in that boat. Um, so I just want to show you a, um, a trailer from, the, from my fastest known time, um, my fastest known time attempt on the Vermont Long Trail. So I want to give you 
I mean, I can tell you about ultra running, uh, but I just want to give you a, a visual um, of, of what the sport is. Um, play. When you feel that intense and exquisite pain, everything else melts away. We put these limits on what a human body can't, could or should do. Women need to take our place in professional sports and we need to show that we are worth watching. And I've been dreaming about running the long tail since I was a kid. A lot of this won't be anything new to her in terms of the kind of thing that she has to go through. Except she's doing it for four days on end. That's a big difference. Four and a half days with very, very little sleep and and lots of miles to cover. That's a new barrier for me to break. She knows the time she has to beat, and she can definitely do it, but it's gonna be a challenge. Anything can happen in ultra running. Francis Ireland said, go Nikki. I hope you have good weather, a tasty bacon cheeseburger. <laughs> It's just going to be some really technical terrain, maybe a crevasse or two to jump. As a physical therapist, I would not tell my patient to do what I'm doing. I mean, it's not smart. You actually can start to get a little delusional. I want her to keep going. I think if she stops to sleep, she's going to realize she's not going to break the record. You can do it. I just give me, can I just have five minutes? I just need five minutes. I, just, I want to die. Our life is governed by what we are capable of doing, and that determines what we become. So that was um, an interesting project. <laughs> <laughs> it really, filmmakers like to make things dramatic. I, I, I wasn't crying the whole time, I swear. Um, <laughs> um, but part of, the, part of the filmmaking was sort of a pay it forward thing. Um, running is a narcissistic pursuit. Um, I mean, yes, in keeping myself healthy, I'm able to help other people. So there is, there, there's that, but, but that's not enough. I mean, if you're a professional ultra runner, um, especially one with a, with a regular job, there's not much time left for other people. I'm worried about what I'm eating. I'm cooking my own food um, because, because I want to be in control of what I eat. Um, I'm spending half of every um, weekday out running. Um, I'm running every day. I'm, I'm making sure that I go to sleep by 8.30 or 9 at night. Um, it, there's a lot that, you know, it, it's a lot to ask of my friends and my family. Um, so in 2007, um, I, was, I was running partners with uh, a journalist in a local, mag in a local uh, newspaper. And, um, and he, was, um, he loved sports, loved running, and, but he also wanted to write a book. And he said, you know, you used to sleep 18 hours a day, and now you can run 18 hours in a day. And, um, and, and so, so I was very frank with him about the depression thing. You know, this book was going to be a long time in coming. Um, and, um, and then in 2007, Western States, he decided, he, he pitched uh, a plan to go to Western States with me and to write a four-piece series on me and on the race. And... Um, and, and I gave him carte blanche to leave, use anything I had said in the past in this article. And I did very well that year. And, um, I, and I won the race. And I got a ton of media exposure um, because our, uh, our senior senator from Montana uh, was one of my crew. 
um, chief of Senate Finance. He was one of the spearhead guys of health care reform. Um, so this sort of elevates what I'm doing. And, and, I, and I'm on a high. And I come home and I read a newspaper article talking about me cutting myself with a beer bottle. And I'm like, how the hell am I going to go to work tomorrow? Everybody knows that I'm mentally ill, that I have this, I have this past, and it's still present. And, and I go to work, and I'm working with a, a Vietnam vet, and he's, he, he's pretty laconic. And um, we've done all of the sort of cerebral parts of the PT, and I'm just putting him on a on a table with some electrodes and ice just to kind of calm down um, the knee. And, and he looks at me and he says, I'm on Zoloft. It saved my marriage. It saved my life. And I knew at that moment that I did what I needed to do and what I did was the right thing. And, um, and since then, I've done podcasts. I've, I've helped with um, race promotion for races that are aimed to destigmatize mental illness. Um, and I, I've talked on television about that. Start public speaking for the first time about depression in uh, 2012. And, and um, in the future, I really, really hope um, to start some running retreats for people with depression. And, um, and I have a psychiatrist at home and a family doc who are friends of mine, and they're really interested in doing this. And it's we want to do it in a way that people do not have to pay. We have a lot of poverty around us. My town is rich, but the towns around us aren't. And, um, and, and so this is a lot of work for something that we're never going to be paid for. Um, but it is something that I'm looking forward to. And, I, um, you know, and sometimes I ask myself why. And um, I gave a talk at a hospital a couple, last week a couple weeks ago, and um, the night before I was to give the talk, my boss calls me and says, remember this patient you saw? He died of suicide yesterday. And we've had four suicides in the town I worked in for 11 years, four suicides in three weeks. And, and this, is why, this is why I do this. So using exercise as a part of treatment for depression, I mean, exercise clearly is one of the things, one of the, one of the variables that saved my life. And so I just want to give you a little bit of my feeling on, um, on depression and, and, and let you know what I get, about, get out of aerobic sports. Increase of energy. Depression makes you tired. Energy comes from exercise. It's ironic, but it really works. And it is a treatment that I was using before I knew I had depression. And that first psychiatrist I had, he knew it. There wasn't the evidence there, but he knew it. He knew that I probably had this my whole life. And that it was mild initially, and, and it was treatable with, with exercise alone. Clear thinking. Depression as it presents in me, besides the lack of energy, is this fog. I can't see through this fog. I can't, I can't keep my thoughts together, and I can't, I, I can't do simple tasks because I get lost in doing them. And, and the clarity of thought that comes with exercise is, is fantastic, and I love that there's research on cognition and exercise and, 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 and that we're really starting to get some hard evidence on this. Um, better sleep. Um, adds a little bit of structure to my day. And it's a healthy coping mechanism. I mean, there are many ways that I could self-treat with depression. And I do believe I have an addictive personality. I'm going to be addicted to something. Might as well be exercise. <laughs> and, um, and a bit of self-advocacy or efficacy. It's, it's this... Um, the worst of my depression, I'm not doing anything. Nothing's happening. I'm sitting there staring at the wall. And, you know, maybe I ran three miles. Maybe I, I ran, walked three miles. And, 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 but I got out. I got out the door. 
and running specifically. Um, I, 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 skiing still has a very, very um, soft spot in my heart, but, um, but running is available to people. It's inexpensive. Um, and, um, and there are many people who use running for their mental health, whether they know they're doing it or not. So you tend to find other people who have these, um, these same experiences or similar experiences. And the other thing about running and running long distance is that we experience physical highs and lows um, that break down social barriers. I mean, once you see somebody puking on the side of the trail during a training run, you know, or you see them have diarrhea and all this stuff, talking, you can kind of talk about anything after that. Um, and, and that really can, it just drives these intimate bonds. Um, and that's very helpful to me. Um, you get a lot of fitness for the time you spend running. And for me, um, for me, um, and for many people, um, frequent volunteer opportunities. Um, on the left, you see my very favorite aid station. Aid station is where you get your food and your water on these 100 mile races. And uh, uh, lead medical person there is always Dr. John Onate. Um, and it's at the top of Devil's Thumb. It's this fantastic part of the Western States Trail where it's just hot, 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 hot. And you're going up this steep climb all the way up to the top. And um, people, I, I, I've seen people come into this or, or sitting at the aid station who might have been in front of me in the race and they're just bedraggled, they look horrible. And, um, and, and, the, and the aid station workers are like, oh, you're fine, keep going. And, um, but, but it, and, and, and it's in the middle of the woods, it's in the middle of nowhere, and they have popsicles that are cold. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just, it's just one of my favorite places. Um, uh, for some of the aid station work that we're doing, and sort of these middle three pictures, um, we're very remote. And to get to this aid station um, at this 100-mile race in Montana, the only way to get there with all the gear we needed was by dirt bike. And, um, and, and ATV, and, um, and we spent 36 hours at this aid station. And things get silly when you're spending 36 hours at an aid station. And, um, and it was uh, three of us and, and just having a great time. And, and, um, and that kind of thing, just, it's just a, an offshoot that, that makes me happy. Um, Girls on the Run, Up on the Right, that's a charity I work with, um, a fantastic group. It helps uh, teach um, sort of the non-cognitive skills that, that one misses in school um, through running. Um, talking a lot about anti-bullying and, um, and um, self-confidence, that kind of thing. Um, and, then, and then this, um, not everybody can, you know, not every runner and every person who uses running to help uh, with depression can can do the exploration I've been lucky enough to do. Um, but we can all um, explore our backyards. And so the picture on the left, in which we're completely lost, is our backyard. It's, it's Big Sky Mountain. And we have no idea how to find this race course that we're looking for. Um, and then um, from the T-Horse Trail um, in the middle, and um, on the right, we're in Morocco, running across the Sahara for seven days. Um, because that's the same thing to do. Um, <laughs> but it's absolutely wonderful. And, um, and I'm just lucky, I'm very lucky that my passions came together. Physical therapy dovetails very, very well with running, since we get injured so often. Um, and, and with the advocacy, it's this sort of accidental synergy of my life. And, um, and it, it's just, from where I've been and for how low I've been to be able to, to help others with that and, um, and to speak about it and, and to help runners with their physical problems, it all just kind of comes together in a really poetic way. And that's really important to who I am now. And um, 
and I just thank you for listening. So we have time for a couple questions. I just want to thank you so much. Um, I just think that there's such a stigma out there, and the only way it would change is through patients talking about it and realizing that mental illness is, you know, it's just everyone, you know, a lot of people are affected by it. So I just really think that's wonderful that you had the courage to do that and show your vulnerability. Um, I I do wonder about the stigma, though. I kind of feel like I'll, I'll always be there because I think people who don't experience or don't have someone who's experienced mental illness think that's very scary thought for them to think that their emotions or their thoughts aren't in their control. And so that's something that does concern me a little bit. I wonder if that's ever gonna change or if there'll always be a tiny bit of a stigma there. Um, but I do think that's the only way it's gonna be beat is by people actually telling their stories. I used to teach at the med school and I remember I gave a talk about depression there and later on I heard like one of the med students committed suicide and I just wonder about that, you know, how it's something that, you know, could maybe be prevented somehow. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's just a very good and very real points that you're making and, um, you know, I think there's a lot of hope. I remember what Kim went through. I remember in the 90s when, when it was so bad when the stigma was so much greater than it is now. And, um, and so I do have hope. Yeah, maybe there will be a little bit of stigma. I mean, when, when, when my former client died just the other week, I was like, what the hell? I've been working, I've been spending the last three years of my life trying to destigmatize him, and he's, and he's right next door and he's dead. And, you know, it, 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 and it doesn't mean what we're doing isn't working. I mean, we're saving people. You guys save lives, and you. Ha and I know it's hard to see. I mean, one similarity between psychiatric medicine and physical therapy is we're not getting the glory. We're not an ER doc saving someone's life very tangibly and very obviously. Um, and we're not the surgeon who does something to the patient that allows the function to be visibly better and, and, and easy to objectify how much better that patient is. You guys are, we have, you have objective tools, but they're not obvious. And so, um, you know, so, so I think that's part of the, the stigma is that people want to be able to have proof that an illness is an illness. Um, they, they, you know, um, somebody has a ACL tear and they can't walk because their knee's all floppy and, and you repair it and they can walk and that's, well, okay, well, I can believe that. I can believe that the diabetic who's going into a coma, I shoot him up with insulin, he's better. Like, like that's, that's really tangible and obvious. And, and so I think, um, I think you're right. I think people need to, need to stand up and talk about this. And, and in the years since I've come out about depression, I'm seeing more and more, maybe I'm looking for it, but I'm seeing more athletes, more actors, more um, people in the public eye talking about depression. And I just have to believe it's getting better. Yeah, thank you again for the, uh, the, your humanity and, and for your support of what we do. Um, we, I work part-time at a tribal health and then part-time at an HIV center. And uh, tribal health just had a suicide of a 15-year-old out of the blue. I had, he had not been my patient, but it reverberates throughout the entire small community. But, but what you remind me of in your story, <clears throat> in a similar venue, I had an opportunity to hear Peekaboo Street talk about her experiences with severe depression. Now, she's, she's a little bit more stubborn than you, and she refused to take any medication, although in retrospect, she says, for probably after she had a traumatic injury, was um, was severely depressed for several months. Um, so I'm just, it, have you ever come across her? Have you ever shared stories? Because I know she's had another issue now. I don't know much about that, but but she she reminds me a lot about um, about your as similar she, to your story. Yeah, and I, I don't know much about her story now, but actually when I was um, 
living in Sun Valley, Idaho during that horrible part of my life, um, Peekaboo was just coming, um, just coming up and just winning her first Olympic medal. Um, and it was before that, like her career ending um, wreck. And, and, um, um, and I'm not surprised about the stubbornness um, with medication. Um, the, we do know that these rural areas have very, very high suicide rates and there's a lot more stigma, I think, there. And um, I mean, I was in her town when I was going through the stuff I was going through and um, it's a tough place. And it's also tough because we all, in these Rocky Mountain states that have high rates of suicide, a um, lot of resistance to seeing doctors, lots of resistance to using medication, and we all have guns. It's a tough combination.